Uh, hi, welcome to this live episode of Shockwaves. Uh, I'm Rob Galuzzo. Uh, sitting next to me is Rebecca McKendry. Hello. Elric Kane is in the can, I think, uh, but we'll make note of that when he returns. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar, uh, we're weekly... Uh, oh, who, oh, I'm sorry. I thought Ernie was waving at me. Hi, He's Ernie. Not. Ernie's here with us too, guys. Uh, we are a weekly horror talk show podcast where we talk about wacky movies like this, new movies, interview people, and uh, we've had Agfa on the show before, or at least mm -hmm. we've had Joe on the show before. And, um, and Brett. And Brett's Brett, been and Brett. on before. Brett's been on uh, multiple iterations of yeah. our show, including Killer POV, the previous one. Um, but for, uh, for our listeners at home, if you guys wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and your role, your role with Agfa, uh, and then we'll delve into this wacky movie we just watched. Yeah. So We'll start with Brett. Okay. I'm Brett Berg. I'm head of theatrical sales for Agfa. I'm Joe Ziemba. I'm the director of AGFA. Alicia Coombs, head of business affairs. Sebastian Del Castillo, head of film preservation. And uh, we have just viewed 1988's Don't Panic, um, which I, I tried to research the history of this film, and legit, there's like not much available online. So what can you guys tell us about the backstory of this one? I think the first thing that people usually ask us is, where can I get some of those wild dino PJs? <laughs> <laughs> How have you not merchandised that yet? My three-year-old has shirt. a pair. I don't know if like, and the, they totally look almost identical. Um, but they're in like three T. So exactly. yeah, I don't, I don't know where I could get an adult pair. And you assume because he wore them through most of it. There's a lot of blood work. Like they had to have like quadruples of those jammies for the shoes. So yeah, I need to know where to get a pair. Yeah, we don't know. We've tried like two decades. It's <laughs> it's really they don't exist. I don't know. Yeah, Elric K Kane has returned from the can. Hello. I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> I just, that's why I went to the bathroom, so I could do that. No, I wasn't uh, uh, El Elric and I have not seen this movie. How, how did you feel about it? I thought it was uh, more entertaining than a couple of the Nightmare on Street sequels and somehow less <laughs> ludicrous than Soul Man. I don't know how that's possible, given that Soul Man is the most ludicrous of 80s comedies. But I actually think I, what I liked most about it, weirdly enough, is it might be the first film I've ever seen, like th movies like Pieces, they're set in America, even though they're shot in Italy or wherever. Mm -hmm. And they go, you know, they put American flags everywhere they can. I love that this one just leads with, oh, I'm going to Mexico now. For, and I, I don't think, and then everything is an American trope after that fact. <laughs> and so it's like, it's kind of perplexing, but I kind of love that about it. It was like a really weird line in culture mix, I thought. So I don't think I've seen that in that, especially not in a slasher film before. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that runs through a lot of Mexican genre cinema because... Mm -hmm. I think that they always start in a place um, where Western culture is influencing them, and they see something that's big out of, across the world. Like, what is the big thing that's happening, and how can we make it for our, on our, make it our own? You know, that goes back to like, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon in Mexico was a red creature, and instead of having protagonists like a scientist, it was the protagonist was Batwoman in the Creature from the Black Lagoon movie in the Mexican one, and like, there's a, a child's play version of child's play from Mexico called Herencia Diabolica, where instead of uh, yeah. Yes, let's give it up one. for that movie. Um, you know, instead of Chucky, there's a little person clown who actually looks like a 500-year-old like Buster Keaton in clown drag. So I must always, see this. Yes, adding different permutations from reality on top of these movies, and, and this one's no different. And this one's kind of like one of the best Nightmare Freddy, Nightmare Fetty movies, which is like you know Freddy ripoffs in that way, um, in terms of what it's bringing to it. Well, so, I, I love that it's like it's a nightmare ripoff in in concept, but like nothing like it at all. Yeah. Like the idea, it's like a possessed serial. Well, don't play with Ouija boards. That's mm -hmm. the lesson in every horror movie. Um, but can you tell us how? So tell us if you can in terms of how Agfa works. How do you find something like this and bring it to a place like this tonight? How, how does that happen? Where did you guys first discover this movie? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know where this movie came from. <laughs> it's been in the archive since I've been around. Right, so Sebastian's like the leader of the archive. He's been around more than any of us at Agfa, so I figured you'd know, but nope. I don't. We don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I wish I did. Yeah, I mean, we have one of the only prints in the world for sure. That's true. Um, you know. Well, back then, um, Tim League and company would regularly just buy depots that would go out of business, like take hundreds of prints at a time and sort it out later. And this, I'm presuming, was just in with the mix of stuff. Yeah. I mean, this is what you want to find in the archive. <laughs> like, these are the movies that we want, you know, and like, yeah. What do you guys know about the filmmaker? Like, I noticed he'd done a couple of other titles before this one. Does he have any history that you can talk about? 
Yeah, there's a really rich history of the Ruben Galindo and his father, um, Ruben Galindo uh, Sr. Um, they were huge movers and shakers in Mexican genre history. And there was a couple of different families. Uh, the Cardonas was another one. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a long line of movies, movie making in the history in the history of their families. And you'll see when they're watching the TV um, in this movie, it's a movie called Cemetery of Terror, which is another one of his movies. Um, but I don't know much about their family other than they were awesome, clearly, you know, and what they did. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they, they were very prolific, made a lot of movies. But um, we did track down John Michael Bischoff, who is Michael in the movie. Nice. Um, he lives in San Antonio now. And um, I emailed a little bit with him. And he also sings the song, uh, Don't Panic, which is incredible. It's going to be in your head for the rest of the year, thank God. Um, and so he's really cool and really nice. And you know, we reached out to him. We're like, we have this print of Don't Panic. Do you know anything about it? And he, he, didn't, he knew nothing. He's just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you want to know about that. And I really wanted to know the lyrics to the Don't Panic song because I can't make them out. But he gave me the lyrics to the song. And um, you know, he, was, he was super nice. But he also did not know where those dinosaur pajamas went. Uh, oh. So you know, They didn't let him I keep asked, a pair? Did what's he, that? I said they didn't let him keep a pair, like wear them always. You would think that they would, but you know. Did he offer any insight as to why the filmmakers deliberately chose the pajamas as like a movie making choice? You know, I he wasn't really forthcoming with information about those pajamas. So I don't know. I just asked him if he still had them. So it does it create it actually creates a really strange for me, this will sound ridiculous, but it did create a weird tension in the film that it goes from like his love scene to his mother holding him in pajamas, mm -hmm. keep saying, calling him baby and stroking his face. And there's this really weird stunted adolescence thing that runs throughout this film that yeah. is actually the creepiest element of the film. This kind of incestual, you know, because I don't know if you could, she has a drinking problem, no, apparently. No, it was totally, because so I saw like, you know, <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> no, but there was this scene where he kept going, I'm scared, Mom, I'm scared. And he was, like, right in her face, like, to an uncomfortable Almost point. burial ground weird, like, <laughs> a, like, you know, dwarf kid thing, you know? I love that you said that. <laughs> burial ground humor. There's a select audience for that. We're here with them. I also like the idea that when you're on the phone uh, to him in San Antonio that he was saying, I have no idea where the pajamas go and he's just like wearing the pajamas. <laughs> like he's just like a grown man sitting there going, I don't know where they went. One of the things that I found most interesting when we were watching the credits is Screaming Mad George did the effects yeah, in right. this. And this would have been like post-society, right? Like, right around. Yeah, because if society, this is 88 and society is like just a year or so before that? Yeah. Is that right? 89. 89. Yeah, oh, so right after yeah. this. Okay, yeah. So, but right. I, I really want to know how he got involved in this. So we now have to track him down and ask him. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone's ever asked him about Don't Panic, so that would be great to hear. Yeah. yeah. And it does have some decent effects in it. Like, there's a couple moments where, where you know, it's good. So. Like the levitating roses. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a good moment. <laughs> it's quite beautiful. We knew that would come back into play. Yeah. <laughs> um, how, how, can, how can people see this? Is, is this only exist as a print? Is there, because Agfa has put out um, some physical releases of their stuff. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how more people can see this crazy little movie? I've been talking a bunch, so I want to hand the mic over. <laughs> um, well, pretty much just theatrically at this point, I would say this print, we might, we did preserve it at one point, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that'll ever, you know, get around. But this print is definitely around. Yeah, you can, you can book this print from us. I mean, we know who owns the movie. We're working on it. We're trying to make it happen so that more people can see this outside of the theatrical print. But time will tell. We'll see. Did it do business at the time? Because I mean, I'm assuming on the zeitgeist of where it was in the nightmare flow, it must have done business. But did it do business here in the States? I would imagine that it mm. did because they struck prints, you know, and dubbed it into English. Um, but gosh, who knows? You know, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I would like to think that it did better than all of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies combined because it <laughs> deserves it, but I don't, I don't think so. It is a really fascinating time capsule of the 1980s, and any time that you can find something that kind of preserves it and kind of the campiness of the wardrobe so well, it, it's always a gem. So it's wonderful to see this. And it's also a family melodrama masquerading as a genre film. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like A Quiet Place or Us in that way. <laughs> Or, or Nightmare on Elm Street, one Elm Street. and two. I think both of them have, you get the Clue Gulliger psychodrama number two a little bit, so it's got a bit of that. Uh, well, should we segue into actual other Agfa stuff that you guys are doing here, with, yeah. especially with the series? Because, I mean, this movie, I feel bad for anyone who's not here and didn't get to experience that, uh, if they're listening. Uh, but in terms of what you guys do, well, I know you've told this audience a little bit about Agfa, and we've had you on the show before 
Uh, but this series specifically, you guys are kind of going through very different subgenres, and it's something I love about movies. And what I think I respond to most about what you guys do is that it's it's almost like, it's kind of like the Danny Perry books. It's equal, you know. Citizen Kane's in black and white, right next to you know Ed Wood, right next to anything. And I I don't think you guys to me don't feel like you have uh, any filter in terms of what you're interested in, what you're passionate about. Uh, so maybe just speak to that a bit about this particular program because I think this is a pretty nice diverse cross section of it. Yeah, um, the you know the the ten years of Agva have really been a journey. Um, you know, for a long time uh, there was no Agva team. The only person caring for and managing these prints was Sebastian for years. Um, there was a long process of having to discover what those prints were, like in the case of Don't Panic. Um, and uh, if anyone in the audience can join us tomorrow for our real one party, we can get into that process more because that's a really what it's all about. But then, uh, you know, from, from that point, being able to get into digital preservation, being able to get into home video, and to be able to, stri to distribute for our label partners, because now we do theatrical distribution for labels like Arrow, Severin, Shout Factory, Vinegar Syndrome, um, and others. So this program really is a sampling um, of all of that, um, from the deep cut prints that are really only available that way to um, our more to our preservations and our label, some of the label titles that we're really excited about. Does it sometimes create uh, problems when you, obviously, if you discover something in a vault or a lab that's closed and you have no idea what the chain of title is? I, I mean, one of the most ex incredible experiences I've had in the last few years in a movie theater was just before Cinefamily closed with The Astrologer, was just like, you just you're speechless <laughs> even though i spoke a lot afterwards uh, but it was you no know, it was really remarkable and i just remember hearing how that was found but also going like how would you then find out who, where who has the rights to that film? obviously if you can't find the auteur behind it it would be really tricky but i imagine that must come up a lot in that scenario like you wait for someone part. to send you a cease and desist. <laughs> oh, really? That's it? Just keep playing it? <laughs> I picture no, well, like an Indiana Jones-esque yeah. search where it involves good hats and mm. like a lot of running from things. So, and this guy. Yeah, and this guy. <laughs> so, yeah, do you have to do a lot of like rights hunting and is it like trails of paperwork that you have to follow along with? Well, when it comes to the prints, um, you know, our, our prints are provided um, – separate from rights you know it's up to when someone books a print it's up to them to to find the rights you know we, we just hold these materials certainly for anything that we want to do anything with beyond that um something like a home video release of course we're doing our due diligence um and anytime you know th th this one's a mystery sometimes if one becomes not a mystery um sometimes we don't screen that one anymore mm. um and it's sad but it means we you know we can't do it we definitely do our due diligence um there was a wild west period but those days are over <laughs> yeah i mean it, it takes a lot of detective work overall i mean we all program too for the alamo so it's like kind of comes with the territory where you have to you kind of figure out a way um working with other programmers how to track down prints and different avenues you can go down and you just kind of get good at it over a period of time but it's really detective work when it comes to rights i'm curious what was there a particular find that was i mean i, I don't even know if the story i read was true about the astrologer that somebody found it and it had the title but they thought it was a different movie that was made around the same time with that title and Almost discarded or something. With that movie in particular? Yeah. yeah, yeah, there were two movies, I think the same year, maybe? Same year that came out, both called The Astrologer. Uh -huh. We should set the record state straight on The Astrologer once for all. Maybe anyone's listening. Like, I was thinking about this, too, that, while we, I was sitting there. It's kind of come up. Yeah, we, we get requests all the time for this movie, and it's played theatrically a lot. So this movie is owned by an entity that will never let it go. We will never be able to release The Astrologer, and it's not because of music rights. It's because it's it's owned by a major studio. <laughs> so, oh, wow. like, ACF is not going to be be putting out the astrologer we love the movie we would love to do it but uh it's just not gonna happen yeah. <laughs> because we don't have lots of money uh so, so that's basically where it's at it's, it's as transparent as possible yeah you know, that's where that movie's at yeah we would love to book it trust yeah. us yeah that's that's actually really interesting i'm it really is. surprised the giant entity owns that movie that's again you cool. find out when you get a cease and desist right you know, that's how it happens <laughs> yeah <laughs> But walk us through some more from this program because I know there's uh, some things close to Becca's heart in this program. Excuse me, <clears throat> Doris Wishman. Doris Wishman. Uh, Wishman. Yes. Uh, we have some Lady Terminator. Uh, just a lot, uh, some of the stuff that we're suburbia. probably more. Yeah, suburbia. suburbia. Uh, mm -hmm. What we're familiar with, but maybe also maybe starting with the real one party because I think a lot of people might not have a clue what that was when you're referencing it. Sure. Well, um, you know, the history of the real one party was that, um, you know, there were so many prints that. Uh, 
we didn't know what they were. Um, so we started setting up these events where we would play the first reel of five prints. What the heck is this, you know? Um, and then once we play th that first night with an audience, um, you know, there's always going to be at least one one gem, one that you have to see the whole thing. So then there's usually a second event um, that shows the whole movie. So that was really one of the um, best ways, one of the most fun ways uh, to discover everything that was in the archive. Um, of course. That process is really over. We, you know, we have everything. Um, we know what they are. It's all cataloged. Um, so now that we're getting to do a real one party here, now it's all of our favorites. So this is the only real one party that's been curated specifically to be like the most fun, wacky sampling of uh, pr the prints that are dear to our hearts. Yeah, maximum impact. Yeah, as Brett always says, guaranteed to rip your head off. Yeah. <laughs> Part of you is going to go on the floor somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, we should. You brought up Doris Wishman, mm -hmm. and we got to talk about Doris Wishman because we are probably the biggest Doris Wishman like fanatics on earth at this point, and um, we love Doris Wishman so much. And um, the fact now that we get to work with her films, um, which I don't know if we've really talked about yet publicly very much. We just we've had a couple screenings, but. Um, and it yeah. rarely comes up on the show because it's it's not necessarily horror. And even though I wedge her into conversations a mm -hmm. lot, like we never get to dive into Doris. And I love yeah. her so much. And if you need horror, she's got A Night to Dismember and mm -hmm. Indecent Desires is a little bit of horror in it. Um, but yeah, so Doris Wishman is, and she's my favorite filmmaker of all time. She's my favorite director. Um, and it just kind of uh, chanced upon that uh, now we are actually uh, restoring all of her films starting from the beginning. Um, and uh, we're really, really excited about that. And we started with Nude on the Moon, which had a restoration at MoMA recently, uh, which was uh, as mind-blowing as this is right now to be on this stage to us. Um, so uh, yeah, so Doris is very near and true, true to our hearts, and it means a lot. It's like a dream come true. Did, and did that come, because something that was always dear to me was something weird video, was, it was just one of those things that I would go to and be surprised. I remember we were talking about Psyched by the 40 Witch off air, and <laughs> seeing that on screen for the first time, just, it's just these pieces of movies that feel completely forgotten, mm -hmm. but still have moments of just brilliance. Uh, but is, it was the relationship uh, of after you know, Mike Rainey's uh, passing, was this part of how Doris Wishman's work came to you? Yeah, it was definitely a connection um, after Mike Vrainey, who was the founder of Something Weird Video, uh, passed away in 2014. And um, Lisa Petrucci, who is his partner and creative partner, um, she's chosen to carry on the torch of Something Weird and keep the legacy going. And those of you that don't know Something Weird, look them up, uh, find their movies, support them, because if it wasn't for Something Weird, I don't know if we'd be here, mm -hmm. really. They were like our film education, a big part of, of why we love what we do and taught us to recontextualize and see movies in a different way. And they have know? an amazing VOD channel now. Yeah. It's, it's really good. Yeah. A lot of great titles on it. Um, and so, you know, Mike had passed away and we reached out to Lisa and started talking with her about, you know, what her plans were. And it just so ended up that she, she was interested in working with us. So we, uh, we did a Kickstarter to get our 4K scanner. Um, and that was successful. And then we started um, working on restorations from the Something Weird archive. And so Doris Wishman came out of that. Something Weird didn't actually own the rights to Doris Wishman. That was a third party. But the same party that owned the Herschel Gordon Lewis movies, we found out owned the Doris Wishman movies. So we started doing theatrical on Herschel Gordon Lewis's catalog. And then after that, the rights holder said, oh, I have um, Doris Wishman's catalog too. And we were like, ah, like, oh my God, what? And so, uh, yeah, we, we jumped at the chance to work with them. Um, yeah, there's a great interview for people who are just curious after hearing you talk about Dorothy, uh, Doris Wishman on the Incredibly Strange Film Show yeah. with Jonathan Ross back in the day. And that was how I first, I had never heard of her, but you know, 20 years ago when I came across all those mm -hmm. on VHS, I remember being kind of just blown away by this you know, elderly woman living in Florida. Where was she working at the end? It was a, a sex, sex, a sex Florida, shop. Right? And she's like, there's just something about her spirit that was just, you know, remarkable. Yeah, there's kind of a transcription of it in the Incredibly Strange book as well, which you can pick up for pennies on Amazon now. But yeah, so walk us through some of the others because I remember uh, back in the day screening Lady Terminator uh, and it was it went over gangbusters at a screening. So I've never seen Sister Street Fighter that it's paired with, but maybe talk a little bit about how, because I didn't realize Lady Terminator part of your collective as part of the Agfa or? Okay. Yeah, the print is. Okay. The oh, the print. Okay. Sister Street Fighter is a title that came to us from Arrow Video and it's mm -hmm. one of the many restorations that they totally kill it with. I don't know if you ever looked at their Blu-rays, but they're some of the best in the world in terms of preserving genre film. Sister Street Fighter was new to me. You knew it, but I didn't actually know it. And it's a companion piece to Sonny Chiba's Street Fighter series. And you know, 
know, it's self-explanatory. Sister Street Fighter, it's awesome. And and who's the actress who? You know? uh, Sue Shiomi. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the cool thing is that like Sister Street Fighter is something that you know is out there, and you can get like you know badly dubbed DVDs or whatever, but it's never been available theatrically, and that's what's really important to us is that like the theatrical experience is so important to Agfa, and so like what we do. So the fact that now there's this gorgeous, stunning, beautiful restoration of Sister Street Fighter that is available to book is like a revelation to us, and like that's like the key thing where it's like, oh man, like seeing this with a crowd, it just means so much. I am so excited about this one because it's one of the few like non-sploitation films that I have not seen, which is like another one of my major um, loves. And I have somehow missed this one. And so I'm super excited to dive into Sister Street Fighter. It's going to be fun. Uh, in the commercial, the UCLA uh, commercial that came up at the start about the archive, uh, the one part that I'm always kind of fascinated, kept, and I guess this maybe starts with you, you, it talks about the cost of preservation. Mm -hmm. And what, what are some of those, what are some of the processes that you're going through? I mean, I'm, I, I don't know, want to be too dry, but I'm just curious why it's so expensive so people can maybe understand that like sometimes when we see this great looking vinegar syndrome that we just take for granted, right? This disc of an obscure movie, there's been so much work put into that and maybe cost so people understand why it's worth buying these things, uh, you know, when they're first coming out. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the scanner costs a lot of money, mm. um, and the labor costs a lot of money, too. Mm. And it's, I assume it's a fairly long process in cleaning up? I mean, I guess it depends on the erosion of a print. or Yeah, it depends on the, the print but or the negative, but I'd say, like, at least a week. Mm. Okay, per time. Depending on what it looks like. Because mm. th when they have the before and after, if we see, the, say, the pink vinegar syndrome, what can be done to that? I guess, I guess that's what I'm saying. If you get something at that stage, is it too late to restore something or... Well, it depends. It can be. Mm. Okay. It's all about the shrinkage. Mm. Uh, film, when it uh, decomposes, can shrink like 1% to 2%, and it's just yeah. enough to not register with the sprockets anymore. Right. Got it. Okay, interesting. And speaking of vinegar syndrome, I think it's yeah. like it's good to say that like right now, because of labels like Vinegar Syndrome and Severin and Arrow and Shot Factory doing all this work, like we're in a golden age of um, not only exhibition, but just availability of these movies. And we should never take it for granted because we have worked so hard for years. You could only see like grainy VHS copies of these movies. And now there's all these beautiful restorations coming out like quicker than we can keep up with. But like go out there and explore these movies and buy them and have fun and enjoy. That's what it's all about. They're there to make us happy. And like we're in like such an amazing age for that stuff now. And like we're so happy to be just, like a tiny small part of that at AGFA. It's really inspiring. Yeah, these restorations are like time machines. You really can reach out and almost feel that past uh, because of the, the way that you can just focus in on the grain and stuff. And I don't know, yeah, like he said, go out and see more movies. But I think all you know that already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and Rob's, you know, the biggest proponent of physical media collecting. But like often, I don't, like I, I always say, I don't, I don't always watch the stuff I collect, but it's like the fact that you know it's there, there's nothing to me worse than seeing oh, something was on Amazon Prime one day and I'll get to that then you go back and it's gone forever mm -hmm. uh, and these things that's happening all the time it's such an unreliable medium when we're talking about streaming mm -hmm. you know it's exciting and it's not yeah. a negative by any means but it's I think there's just such a still something so valuable about physical media um, I assume that's why you collect everything you have every it's movie it's out of control <laughs> at this point but no I mean it's I prefer <laughs> a room right prefer it's seeing, a room it's an apartment full of yeah. physical media at this point but no I mean this is the two best ways to watch a movie obviously are theatrical with an audience and at home like I just I've never to this day I've never had a flawless streaming experience like there's no. always something the subtitles will be off it'll go you know blurry for a sec whatever it is um, but that never happens when you invite friends over and pop over a blu-ray and see films like this restored and probably better than they've ever looked before so yes. yeah it's important to me to collect stuff physically too I mean Again, uh, Vinegar Syndrome puts out whatever it is, four, five, six titles a month, and it is uh, Russian roulette, I call it. It's not even a gamble. It. it is yeah. Russian roulette. Like, I watched Nightmare what is Weekend this? last weekend. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was, I don't even know what, what there was a puppet. There was, it was, it was a puppet. It was, it was chaos. There was a computer. There was, yeah, yes. it, was, it was chaos. I got to see Runaway Nightmare this year. And yes. It was one Mike Cartel's the, Runaway Nightmare. The person I watched it with was done in like 30 minutes, and we, we stopped it and put something else on. I said, can we come back to that? We put it back on, <laughs> and by the end of it, I was like, this is amazing. Like, it's just one of those films that one 
won you over over time. I hope that. I mean, last year, I think our film of the year was The Devil's Honey, which was a Severin title. And that one, none of us had heard of it. Fulci, like we've never seen before. It was full Fulci. It was full of a lot of things. Um, But yeah, that was definitely like one of our best finds of the year. And that was a Severin one that we had never even heard of. And we thought we had seen all Fulci. So it's Fulci doing Red Shoe Diaries. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. With a subtle saxophone scene at the start, which is very <laughs> subtle. Very subtle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the runaway train actually, and I, you know, I hate because it gets used so much. People say things are Lynchian, but there's moments <laughs> in Runaway Nightmare where um, some of the dialogue and some of the characters look like some of the extras in Blue Velvet, and the way they deliver dialogue, it, it's so stilted. It doesn't seem purposely Lynchian. It feels like this guy. They're different universes, and yet it has some quality that's coming out of that. That just, I don't know. I think, I think if you're an explorer of movies. Uh, I mean, you guys certainly, you know, without a doubt, are, and that's part of your job is to uncover this stuff. But I feel like as audience members uh, being on the hunt for that discovery, these labels are all providing that. And the idea, yeah, you might say a couple, a couple things that bore you or are, are not your bag, but you will also find something like I just was telling you off air, the child in the new Arrow box set for me just a couple days ago after seeing a couple in the first box set, none of them really spoke to me. And I saw that film and halfway through, I was like, this is might be the find of the year, you know? Uh, it has something magical and um, unplanned about it, you know? I love the, uh, the, the various labels, you know, um, focus on different niches. Uh, you know, Vinegar Syndrome has a couple of my favorite, like, home video horror titles, um, like Dear Dead Delilah and Dominique are two of my mm-hmm. favorites. It's like a certain area that they get into that uh, I don't see from the other labels that's really exciting. Dear Dead Delilah is like a um, summer stock doing Tennessee Williams with Agnes Moorhead, but it's also a horror movie. Yeah, and it Sounds uh, like my jam. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. Right. And uh, Dominique is like Diabolique, but... Um, but not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but double. <laughs> but um, yeah, fitting into that like quiet um, sort of regional. It's, a, it's like a very specific niche that I, I love finding those niches within label offerings. And I guess we've been kind of trying to figure out what our niche is too. And we kind of feel like it, it's it's sort of an outsider yes. feel, um, even though we, we, we deal in different, you know, we don't have like a the option to focus on a particular genre or, you know, anything really specific, but um, everything we're drawn to and everything we hunt after um, has this outsider feel. Yeah, we had a conversation in the office about it recently. We're like, oh, this is what we do. It's outsider filmmaking. Mm-hmm. That's that's the stuff we gravitate towards. And I think on like, Sarah Jacobson's films, which are playing uh, later as part of this series, like I think that was the one that kind of like solidified it for us. We're like, oh, that's what we do, her movies. Um, I was, I was uh, familiar with those ones, and I know TCM Underground recently did it, which was mm-hmm. super cool. But the film you're playing after those two, uh. which is like a 40-minute film by the actress who was in uh, Helen Lauder films and a whole bunch of mm-hmm. st- stuff, I had never heard of that. And yeah. I saw it on the, uh, posted on the site. Can you explain a little more? Oh, of course. Yeah, so uh, the movie you're talking about is Limbo from 1999. It's uh, written and directed by a woman named Tina Krauss, um, who was most well-known for starring in hundreds of movies by this company called Wave Productions in the uh, 90s. And Wave Productions was a mail-order movie company, like Song Poems, which is like people would go to their house and write down scripts and send it to Wave and pay them $1,000, and then they would make their movies on camcorders. And as you can Uh, imagine, it's incredible. Because like I want to read the autobiography of these people for every one of these wave movies because they get out there and they get strange. So Tina Krause was an actor in all of these movies. She appears in hundreds of wave movies. And I had no idea that she had actually written and directed her own shot on video horror movie. And you would think that, um, you know, going into this movie, it would be something similar to a Wave Productions movie. It's just like a zombie movie or it's a Dracula movie where Dracula drowns in quicksand because that seems to happen in every Wave movie. I don't know why. There's just a quicksand thing going on. But uh, Limbo is actually something more than that. I mean, not only was it the, one of the only shot and video horror movies made by a woman, uh, but it is a very, as you'd said, Lynchian in a way. It's a kind of it's like David Lynch and Nine Inch Nails getting together to make a shot on video horror movie. Movie. and it's exactly like that so it's, so it's a, lost highway yeah yeah it's it's, it's lost highway it's yeah, Tina Cross's lost highway um but it's it's really unique and it's really well done and it's serious a lot you know, like during the 90s people were like, getting ironic and they were like meta and they're going the comedy route and this is like dead serious it's very personal to her and she just made this one movie and discovering that was really special to me because that's like exactly what I'm drawn to um so when you approach her is she just like what 
like that you want to show this? Is is it like, or is it actually really touching to somebody that you're uncovering this and like bringing it to an audience? Yeah, it's actually both. And I mean, how it happened is um, I'm part of Bleeding Skull with uh, my partner Annie Choi, who's here tonight, and our friend Zach Carlson. And um, how that happened, uh, that whole thing is we're working on a, another book that's coming out with Fantagraphics in 2020. It's called Bleeding Skull in 1990s Trash Horror Odyssey. And um, so pre Limbo. Pre-order it now. Uh, thanks. Uh, I Limbo pre-ordered is... mine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Limbo is one of the movies that I had watched for the second book. And when I it was one of my favorites, one of my top 10 favorites of the book. And, you know, we were just like, where is this movie? Like, what's going on? And we found out that Tina had lived in Brooklyn and Annie lives in New York. So we thought, let's reach out to Tina Krause and try to get some stills from the movie for the book. And we did that. And then Annie ended up being like a hero and meeting up with her and like, you know, talking and hanging out and getting drinks and stuff. And then finally I was like, do you want to ask her about Limbo? Maybe she, just, she wants to do something with it. And so Annie asked her like, hey, do you want to work with Agfa and Bleeding Skull to release Limbo? And I think she flipped out. I think she was super excited. I think she told, called her dad and was like, do you remember that movie I made 30 years ago? Well, it's finally going to come out. Um, so uh, it's really fulfilling when that happens because you don't, know how people are going to react. You know, they made this movie 30 years ago. Maybe it's something that's painful for them. Maybe it was something that they'd forgotten about. But with her, I think she was just stoked. She was so happy because I think when she originally tried to get the movie out there, she would submit it to film festivals and they would reject her. And then she would submit it under a man's name and they would accept her. Yeah. So at one of these screenings, she actually submitted it and she got accepted and she won the award, like the best new movie at the screening. And she went up there and she was like, fuck you. I'm <laughs> Tina Krause, not Michael Krause. Um, so... It's a great story, you know, yeah. and the movie deserves to be out there. It's important to shot on video horror history. It's important for humankind in general that this movie be out there. So. And will it get out there beyond the screening? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, it's coming out uh, next February with Agfa and Bleeding Skull. So we're releasing it. Cool. It'll be on Blu-ray and DVD. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we've had a long-running uh, in-joke between us about the connoisseurship of SOV uh, cinema. I, I like to call it the great pouponing of SOV. Uh, we, we talk about but, this a fair amount on the show as well. Yeah. It comes up. And, and, and we realize that the best through line just marketing-wise for certain titles like Limbo or any of the other SOV titles that we've put out is just our enthusiasm for them. Mm -hmm. That tends to um, bleed through uh, easily. So we just we've led with that. But we've long talked about how to isolate like the finest moments in SOV cinema and give them a platform, and Limbo is in that tradition. And uh, well, Limbo is a special one too because um, when you watch it, you know exactly what it would look like if she had the money she needed. Mm. You know, um, which uh, that's a great thing to see. I mean, that's all her. That's all the the talent that's behind it. So, so you know, sometimes you. Don't necessarily see that was shot on video, but the good ones, you know, you see the passion behind it and you see the vision. Like they don't have the money, but you see the vision completely. Are there any SOV gems? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I know Severin, well, Intervision originally put out, you know, Sledgehammer and a couple other films yeah. at that time. Things. But then there are other, yeah, things. Well, Things is actually Super 8 a lot. Super of 8. It. Oh. Yeah. But, you I know, take it back. it's still in that thing. Yeah, it you know? feels part Jeez, of the guys, group Super 8. <laughs> Um, no, but it, yeah, things has the spirit of Nail that uh, homemade film. Is no Nail Gun Massacre, I'm not sure. No. Which one? Nail Gun Massacre? Is not. No, that's There's film, one right? of the Massacre films. No. Oh, Wood Chipper Massacre is... Oh, that's, that's the one. Yeah, Wood Chipper Massacre. That is not one of the gems I'm talking about. But are there <laughs> other... other fun! <laughs> oh, man. Um, it's like family tie has gone wrong. It's kind of, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's fun. But uh, are there gems out there that you guys would... You know, I don't know if you can talk about things you have your eye on or that you'd love to get, but are there just things that you think deserve to cross over to... You know, to audiences that maybe have the stigma of being SOV. Yeah, absolutely. There are <laughs> lots of those. Um, I think that the great thing about um, you know the labels rediscovering this movies, like you mentioned, Intervision doing Sledgehammer and things. I mean, they were the first ones to actually put these out on DVD and make them available. And I think the good thing about it is that it's. Um, reconfiguring the way that people look at these movies. You know, I think that there used to be a big stigma with shot on video horror and it, you were not cool if you loved Boarding House at one point in oh. time. And uh, you couldn't talk about it, you know, because people would look at you like there's something wrong with you. I'm a huge fan of Boarding House. I love it. It's one of my favorite movies. And your coworkers would be like, ah. Like, I don't know, that's, that's like, scary. Maybe you shouldn't talk about that at work. Um, but I love your coworkers that they knew Boarding House. That's cool. Oh, uh, <laughs> even, to, even to reject you, that's they cool. They did not, but I showed them a little bit of it. And anyway, um, I got fired, by the way. Oh, what? Uh, anyway, um, so uh, what, I, what I mean to say is that um, 
there's a shift in culture. People are looking at these movies differently because of the way that they're being reissued in the world and presented to people in a new way. And it's with respect. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the key. Um, and I think that's what's really important. I mean, there's, we're always going to be battling against so bad it's good, always. Like, we hate that. Like, every day we wage war against that because it's not kind to the filmmakers. And it's a very entitled type of thinking, like saying that, like, you can laugh at this movie because it's not up to your standards. It's like, come on, get the fuck out of here. Like, that's, that's no, there's no place for that anymore. So I think the important thing is that these movies are being put out there and, and being allowed to breathe and being allowed to be seen in a new way, which is super important. But to answer your question, yes, there's a lot out there that we are excited <laughs> about. Um, you know, coming up with Agfa and Bleeding Skull, uh, there's, uh, you mentioned Things. Uh, Barry J. Gillis, who is one of the geniuses behind Things, made a movie called Wicked World in 1991 as a follow-up to Things that uh, never was really released, and we are releasing that movie in November. <laughs> Barry. Yeah. Yes, we have a Barry J. Gillis fan in the house. Thank you, <laughs> and, sir. And I think Barry's here too, right? <laughs> Maybe? No. Okay. It, uh, features okay. a, it features a novel editing style you will enjoy. Oh. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mustache or no mustache? Is he in it? Oh, yeah. oh yeah. He plays a uh, loose cannon cop oh. uh, on the trail oh, of a yeah, serial killer who killed his girlfriend. Oh, wow. Yes, okay. he is. Um, but awesome. yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff on the way. And like, uh, one that I'm particularly excited about is uh, there's this guy from Chicago named David The Rock Nelson, mm -hmm. um, who is a uh, tireless champion of making, uh, you know, werewolf and Frankenstein movies in his backyard that feel, and I mean this as a compliment, feel as if a 10-year-old picked up a camcorder, but he's like 50. He and calls himself the modern day Ed Wood, and he, he like, does. he owns it, like he emblazons it on his Facebook page, like that is his claim to fame, and so yeah, like it, it has it. an aesthetic in it, though. Yeah, like, there's something pure. to it. That guy's pure. He's the purest as it comes. Um, and uh, so we finally, after like months of talking, we were able to work with him to finally start releasing his movies, uh, I think in 2021, which is really, really exciting for me because being from Chicago and kind of growing up and uh, maturing with his movies and, and finding them in the mid 90s and now actually being able to, for the first time ever, bring them to a new audience is really special and insane that it's happening. To get excited in advance, I, ad I advise you to all follow him on YouTube. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. He, his YouTube channel is fun. A never-ending stream of content. <laughs> dunk it for the mummy, man. Got to dunk my donut and eat my coffee and java, man. <laughs> There's a little preview. <laughs> a taste. Yeah. Uh, any other key titles from this particular series uh, that we're missing? I know it is. It ends with Suburbia. Is that right? The series. The series here? Yeah, Suburbia and Rock and Roll High School. Okay, yeah. Nice. Nice. But am I missing any of the key events? I just want to make sure that they're all highlighted because... Well, um, also uh, the Miskatonic offsite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We got to talk about that. And Lisa Petrucci oh, and Something good. Weird. These are kind of go together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're showing Nude on the Moon, the, the Doris Wishman mm -hmm. uh, re restoration that we were talking about, which has been a fantastic bridge for Agfa to the rest of the world because not only did it the restoration of this movie premiere at MoMA. It's also playing here at the Hammer and has played at the BFI and will be, and also played at Cineteca Madrid on July 4th. Wow. Um, so Doris's work is getting out there and she's going to have a following. Whether she wants it or not, she's going to have it. <laughs> And so what, what is the um, Miskatonic? I know Kayla was here earlier. Uh, what, what is the topic of the Miskatonic conversation exactly? Because I, I saw Robert, Roberta Finley's name also mentioned. Yeah, so Lisa Petrucci of Something Weird Video is going to come down here from Seattle, and she's going to give a whole two-hour-plus presentation on the work of Doris Wichman and Roberta Finlay, two of the only female exploitation filmmakers of that era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, the, and these, these lectures are all uh, horror-based lectures that are held at the UPRS, which is the uh, University of Philosophical Research Studies, mm -hmm. which is a really just one of those spaces that if you haven't been yet, uh, find an excuse to go because it's like this little gem in LA. It's definitely a hidden spot. Ask to uh, tour the library. Yeah. It's it's so Lovecraftian. It, it really does look like P. Manley Hall set up, and he actually is the person who uh, married um, – 
uh, Bela Lugosi, and so there's photos. I mean, he didn't marry Bela Lugosi, but he he, he held the ceremony Dude. there. Yeah. Um, it would have been interesting, but um, but no. So it's got this rich history. But you go. This is the thing about LA. It, there's something I sometimes really dislike when everything's so new and dirty, and then sometimes you'll turn a corner and there's something perfectly preserved from a different era that uh, to me is just uh, has this utterly rich uh, history to it, and mm -hmm. kind of like what you guys do. And so I remember when we kind of connected that to Miss Cup. Those two things were you know a perfect. Fit. Yeah, I'd driven so, past that building half. A dozen times and it wasn't until we did the tour that I was like oh my gosh it's just it's brilliant this so sounds like a good go excuse. to Miskatonic yeah. and ask to tour the library it's wonderful oh one other thing that we forgot that's in the series so also on the bill with um nude on the moon is smut without smut right oh, yeah. so smut without smut is a new I guess we'll call it an anthology series that uh that Joe cuts together from vinegar syndrome's archive of uh triple x movies so we've we've been trying to find uses theatrically for vintage adult film, and it's kind of tricky in today's market. So this is one way to actually get that, con to preserve the work, in a way. Yeah, because um, I'm, I'm so obsessed with horror movies that I gotta see everything, and, and all the DIY stuff, I wanna see more of it. And in the adult world, there are all, all these like hour-long horror movies um, that are just fascinating to me, because they are as low budget as it gets. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are just like the lowest of the low. And, um, but they also happen to be adult movies. So it's like, not everybody wants to watch that. So how, how can we like watch these things? So um, the idea we had is to take these adult movies and cut out all of the sex scenes and then present them as just straight horror movies. And what is that like? And it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's so great. So wow. we did uh, three as kind of warm ups um, with something weird and vinegar syndrome at Alamo shows and we just screened them. And then the one that we have now that's available theatrically is called Smut Without Smut Bizarro Horror Night. And that's like the one, that's like the best of the best um, and so yeah we cut that together and um, it's it's so much fun to watch because you're never gonna see this stuff I mean normie normies like people that are like civilians like are not gonna go seek out you know dr. sexual and mr. Hyde you know they're just not gonna do it uh, so it's a way for people to see these things without feeling bad <laughs> or like you know feel like you know it's like just have fun and watch it you know so um, yeah and it's playing with Nude on the Moon because one of the features included is Doris Wishman's Haunted Pussy, a.k.a. Nice. Come With Me, My Love. Mm -hmm. where, where does the smut go that you edit out? You don't want to know. It's a whole different reel. Is that the extra features? It's just the smut <laughs> oh, no. in a row for the... we got to screen that. If we can it's, screen that at the UCLA archive, oh, man. Well, it's we like five it. and a half hours long because the movies oh, are yeah. 60 minutes and you cut out all the sex and they're like 17 minutes. Wow. So it's a very long reel. Is there a particular one that is just as, as a film you were actually like, this is actually a really great film? You know, there's, uh, there's a couple. Uh, there's one called Widow Blue uh, that is just very I wild. Heard, I heard a, a sigh from the audience. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, oh my God, like it goes to some dark, strange places. Widow uh, Blue? Widow Blue. A yeah. widow. Okay. Widow Blue, also known as, uh, Joe, what is the other, what is the title? Sex, sex psycho. psycho that's it yeah <laughs> sex psycho widow blue that one is just deranged that one makes you feel like okay like i need two days to not watch any movies because i have to process what i just saw um but it's just like a straightforward soap opera slasher that just goes to some very very dark places um, and directed by a guy named walt davis who sebastian really loves the other I love one walt davis yeah, yeah. what's evil the other one evil, um, evil come evil go evil come evil yes go. another great vinegar syndrome disc excellent yeah. Evil come, evil go. Yeah. Oh, and, and like Alicia meant to mention the Haunted Pussy, the Doris mm -hmm. Wishman movie. That is just one of the best like adult, in, in, my, in my opinion, because it's uh, Doris Wishman doing her Doris Wishman thing, which is mm -hmm. totally surreal and completely removed from reality, like totally. But it's, uh, it's a horror movie. So we were talking about she only made a yeah. night to dismember, but she made another horror movie, even though she refuses to say, like she, she was like, I never made an adult movie. Like I never did that, but she, she did. She, to her death, said she never made adult yeah. movies. Yeah. But she did, and The Haunted yeah. Pussy is really like a fantastic addition to Doris's filmography. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, any other gems that we're missing, just to make sure we don't skip over anything? Well, I mean, Suburbia is fucking amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's, it's Suburbia and Rock and Roll High School are two movies that we got as part of a theatrical deal with Shout Factory, and it opened up a whole floodgate of really awesome hits for us and things that have been, for years as a programmer, hard to book, and now for those to be suddenly easy to book is like a joy for us both on, on the exhibition and distribution sides. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there, I mean, I, I assume there's still labs closing and uh, I'm sure there's still movies being lost in the shuffle. Uh, is, it, is this still a, a massive danger? Are there still titles that you know of that 
could be lost in terms of if they're not restored properly, uh, will never make it to us? Is that still something that we should be concerned about? Oh uh, yeah, I would say yeah. I'd say that that's that's Way the to case. Me down, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think I think most of the labs by now have have closed that okay. are going to close. I think there are still some that are open that are getting business and that are actually thriving. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there are still some that are in danger of being lost forever. Yeah, I mean, and also like the you owe know, a lot of preservation to people who collect these movies and find them. It's not just archives; it's individuals. And like we have Phil Blankenship in the house tonight, and Phil is probably like the world's foremost authority on prints, period, and where they are in lost movies. And it's it's because of his like superheroic efforts that we get information. You know, I mean, it's it's because of people like that with who like calmly and quietly in the background are just doing this amazing work that like you know. Like, you got to give it up for Phil. It's like, it's incredible what he does. I mean, really. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's all over the world, but it's because of people like Phil that are finding these movies and enabling us to, you know, help preserve them. What's the, what's the book? The Thousand Cuts? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've already I forgotten the title. Sorry. Phil, what's the title? Okay, nailed it. It All is right. a thousand cuts. <laughs> that I can throw to you. Um, but you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It seems like the secret history uh, of what, and some of the behavior being illegal, and yet it's without that behavior and without people saving these prints, we would be the ones losing. We, you know, cinema would be the victim of this ultimately. So it's kind of, it's a remarkable story. It's some of the characters who are portrayed in that. I think it's really worth your time if you can seek it out. And also tomorrow night's event, The Real One Party, is very much in the spirit of all that print collecting. Mm -hmm. For example, we'll be talking about the Magna Carta of print collecting, Big Real Magazine and its influence on just collecting in general and how all these collections that still survive basically thrived on the lifeblood of this one uh, publication, which is essentially a gray market trading floor for prints before the internet. Mm. And uh, yeah, we'll be talking about stuff like that tomorrow night and showing the fruits of the labor of all the collectors. Uh, I mean, while we're while you guys are here, we're not gonna. You might not get this chance again. So if there's any questions, I guess we could yeah. run out and uh, give you the mic. I'm happy to take it up. Oh, you have two mics. Oh, cool. excellent. Any questions? Yes, there's one right yeah, there. Yeah, right there. Hello? Um, Hi. I'm, hey. I'm curious how, a uh, question for the AGFA team, how important is it for you to be able to, when you're restoring these films, how important is it for you to be able to find the actual filmmaker and speak to them about their work? Because you've talked about uh, getting in touch with um, the woman who directed Limbo. And I would assume that's an important part of the process, but I'd also assume for some of these really small films, you may not be able to find anyone connected with it. Oh, yeah, there's a few of those. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd say it's really important. It's it's uh, it's either one of two things. One, they're no longer with us, unfortunately, because a lot of the movies are older, you know, so they're not around. Um, but two, it's like usually with movies that are really obscure and at small releases, the director usually owns the rights or the producer. So that's the person you have to find in order to find out, like, can we play this movie? Can we put it out? Um, so it's pretty important, I think. Um, in terms of telling the story is also important, especially um, if you are going to release a Blu-ray, you know, to get them involved and get them talking about the movie. Um, yeah. Other questions? Everybody's quiet because we already talked about the astrologer. <laughs> I shouldn't have led with that. That was my bad. Yeah, right there. Do you have any, like, stories about... Uh, strange places that prints were being stored. You know, I've heard stories about like prints being stored in a barn or in caves and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can just tell you the strangest print buy that I ever went on. And if more than one person in this room probably went to the same place, and you know what I want to say, it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house basically in Orange County where this dude who worked <laughs> for Regal, um, who was a projectionist, had several hundred prints in a storage, in a barn, in his property. And when he brought people onto the property to look at them all for sale, he lined them up in the sun. Like, <laughs> just the reels themselves, the like print, reels on cores, or just reels without the cores, kind of just slowly unspooling themselves in the baking sun on, the, on this, like, total Texas Chainsaw Massacre house property. And uh, I don't know, you just, you, you brave it because it's worth the effort. I also bought that 
print of the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer concert film from some Russian mobster guy in the valley in an <laughs> apartment parking lot. Everybody just like went crazy. What? You have an Emerson, Lake, and Palmer print? <laughs> ah! Yeah. Um, like Sebastian and I took some road trips um, to some cool places to find prints. Yeah, I mean, you know, we went to New Mexico once, and that was pretty weird. Uh, we got stuck talking to uh, an, an older gentleman who he had like this, like he was really old. He was like 80 years old, and he had like one of those punk studded metal belts on. And, it's super, and vans. And vans, yeah. And he uh, just sat with us the entire time we were going through this house, like looking at their materials. And he wouldn't leave us alone. If we would like walk upstairs, he'd go, Joe, Sebastian, where are you? Get back down here. So he could tell us more stories about the good old days. And we had to kind of like put up with it because we wanted to buy his films. Uh, but it was a long day. So you kind of meet all kinds and you just kind of, you know, you, you just roll with it. He just described your average pot deal circa 96. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, right there. He's coming for you. Well, this isn't a question, but I wanted to point out, in case you guys weren't aware that Don't Panic is actually on US DVD. I think it's really out of print now, but it came out on BCI in a eight pack called Crypt, Crypt of Terror. Terror. <laughs> yeah, and that's got uh, Cemetery of Terror too. Which Everybody should watching, go and buy that. Set. Yeah, I agree. It's great. There are like seven other Mexican horror films from the Galinda family. It's great. Doesn't it have a skeleton with a sombrero on the cover or something like that? <laughs> something ridiculous? Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> At the back, right? Yeah, right behind you. Uh, you brought up the fact that there are some people who own movies to which you have materials on that, for whatever reason, don't want them in circulation. What are some of the most bizarre uh, cert instances of intransigence you've come across from uh, producers or rights holders regarding films that you wanted to help bring back to market. <laughs> I, got, I got a good story. Go for it. I, I, don't, I don't wanna, I wanna make sure, like, did you wanna, okay. I don't wanna take over this conversation, but um, so I won't, <laughs> I'm not gonna say any names. Uh, but once uh, for a Terra Tuesday at the Alamo Draft House in Austin, Terra Tuesday is our weekly horror series that we do. Um, we played a movie that we had in the archive. And um, we didn't know who, we always do due diligence, obviously. Like we look it up and try to find who it is. And we couldn't find it, so we ran the print. And then we heard back from someone about a week later that was like, you ran my movie. Um, it's going to be $3,000 like off the top just to pay me. And so we're going to have to work out a deal so that to make sure that you have to make this up to me. And so I got on the phone with this guy, and I was like, well, we can't pay you $3,000, obviously. We usually pay like $300 or whatever. We'll do that. And he was like, no, 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 no. You got to make it up to me. And so it kept going and going, and he's like, he's like, finally, here's what I want to do, okay? We're going to set up a new screening of this movie in your town. You're going to do another tarot We're going to play the movie, but I'm going to get my band to come down to Austin <laughs> and play. And it's me on bass. It's Rob Zombie on vocals. It's the drummer from Slayer on drums, and that's it. And we're going to come down, and we're going to play a show. It's my close friend, Rob Zombie. And uh, we're going to make this happen. We're going to have women walking around in bikinis with TVs. And on the TV is going to be the trailer for the movie playing in the lobby. So before they go in, they know what they're going to see. And it was like, clearly, this person is like a maniac and has like <laughs> lost their mind. Um, but that was, it's such a weird, surreal experience to be talking on the phone to someone who's dead serious and probably doesn't even know Rob Zombie, to be honest. Uh, but uh, stuff like that happens. It just happens. You know, and you gotta, you, like I said, you gotta roll with it and be like, yes, sir, that, that sounds like a great idea. Like, that's set it up. Call me next week. So, and did then, you do the screening? Hell no, we did not do the screening. <laughs> I deleted his number from my phone and went about my business. And we oh, just I wanted to see who would show up. If not Rob <laughs> Zombie, who does he bring? Oh, God. Any others? Well, you have the whole brain trust here. Well, I have one while they think of questions. So, um, Elric and I probably spent a good half an hour on the show a few weeks ago talking about Tammy and the T-Rex. Oh. Do we have any Tammy and the T-Rex updates? Soon. <laughs> It'll be available soon. It did place okay. in Apocalypse too, right? It did place in Apocalypse in Chicago. It's got a few more festival appearances, and then it'll be out in the world. And trust me, people will be excited. I can't wait. Can you explain, though, for people who here don't know what we're talking about or at home who might have seen Tammy and T-Rex but not seen what we saw, the <laughs> version we saw, which to me I can't even imagine seeing the other Cause, version. Because what I saw in USA was not what you showed us. 
No, no. Okay, so I guess we'll we'll just unravel the story of Tammy for everybody, <laughs> because it it really it took a village to bring this together. Mm. So, uh, one of the people who works in the video department at Alamo Draft House, Zane, he is the the spirit animal of Tammy because he was the one who found it and in like a video call to a bunch of us at the company was like have you all seen Tammy and the T-Rex? And then it just proceeded to talk about it a lot and get very excited. So then Joe, who programs Alamo's Video Vortex residency, programs Tammy, and it instantly, instantly becomes the biggest Video Vortex hit in the residency's history. I put it up in an event here in LA called The Five Minutes Game. It like wins very enthusiastically. The label who's putting it out, one of uh, their folks was at the screen, the five minutes game, and he was like, well, we have to put that out on, on Blu-ray. And so a year later from that, here we are. It's and, been restored. Yeah, and so to answer your question, I mean, previously you only knew what you saw on cable or the VHS version, which was a PG-13 kind of uh, high school melodrama involving someone turning into a, a mechanical dinosaur. It's like, you know, usual stuff. Uh, but the version that's going to be out there is an R-rated cut with uh, gore added to it, um, which changes the movie completely and makes it a totally new experience. Yeah. So there was a lot of eviscerations, and Jean-Claude Buechler did all the effects. He did? I didn't yeah. even know that. I didn't yeah. realize that. Ah, it is, on too soon. Yeah. It is Denise Richards and Paul Walker in a post-Jurassic Park rom-com with a mechanical dinosaur in it. And and his brain is planted into the mechanical dinosaur. And after we saw it, literally, we're walking back to the parking lot, and I looked to Elric, and I was like, I, I started processing, and I was like, that had, like, a huge chunk of the same cast as Mannequin 2. Don't ask me why I remember the cast from Mannequin 2. <laughs> but we're walking back to the car, and I'm like, hold on. No, that had, like, seven of the same actors from Mannequin 2. And I start Googling on my phone, same director as Mannequin 2. And as Mac yeah. and me. <laughs> Ice Pirates. The list goes oh, on. Right, right, it right. goes on. <laughs> it's also quite a touching movie. There's a really sad scene with Atrena. He's trying to call on a payphone, and his little arms can't reach the dollar. And it's just like, but he still your heart checks the quarter slot. <laughs> Yeah. And a very sexy <laughs> ending. So, <laughs> but but the, the, you said added. You said you, you said it as if like the gore's added. But I have to assume that the director's vision, the movie that he made, is this gory, weird teen film. And then the movie that got delivered to the world was this very neutered thing. So this is this is where the exciting part of I think what you guys do, the exciting part of what we get to do when we get to discover things that excite us, is like this is the movie. This is the movie. The movie you've seen before was not the movie. It was the movie that was forced into existence by censors and networks. But the actual movie that was intended is a gory, strange romp, I assume, right? Yeah, a Peter Jackson-level gore comedy. Yeah, no, it's, it was crazy. Which was then, well, the only time it had a release which was on tape was a kind of way cut back PG-13 version of it, presumably to sell to kids. But there's nothing in the movie that appeals to kids and all the jokes would go over their head. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's quite raunchy. Forget about the gore. It's actually quite a raunchy film, so it would... I don't think it would succeed on that level either. But I never saw it on cable, so I don't know what you're seeing. But I had seen it, and I, it, you're right. It doesn't exactly resonate with kids because it wasn't. It didn't become <laughs> no. my never-ending story exactly. I was just kind of like, yeah, I saw that, I think, and then it, it was gone. Um, so yeah. But I like the way she writes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch that one for the. You got you to watch it. Yeah, I mean, just from a pure marketing perspective, it's a great thing to have a movie that has this potential cult appeal that can appeal to like a 50-50 male female mm -hmm. audience. Things like Birdemic don't necessarily do that, but this kind of cuts across. And it has movie stars, which is always good. Mm -hmm. Yes, you will be hearing more about Tammy in the future, trust yes. me. <laughs> worth it, well worth it. Uh, any last questions? Well, thank you guys yeah. so much for joining us tonight. This has been awesome. And thank you for having us here and, and for bringing don't, for panic don't Panic to the wow. screen. <laughs> Uh, I mean, thank you. Thank you, everyone in this room. We're so grateful to be here with you. Yeah. Uh, we're so appreciative. And what an age where we can bust down the barriers and have such wonderful and wild genre and exploitation movies happen in real film institutions. You're in one of the most hollowed film institutions on the planet watching Don't Panic. <laughs> I think Billy Wilder would have dug that film. <laughs> I just think it would have hit that ticklish spot on him, you know? It's, I think we did him proud. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.